All right, I am so very proud of each of those individuals who came to confess their faith in Jesus Christ, to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you uh, the one difference between just being dunked in some water and a baptism. And that difference is the faithfulness of Christ and the faithfulness he rises up in those who are willing to follow him. Ultimately, it comes down to this one thing is, is what leads us to Christ. As we say yes to him, it's our willingness to risk everything in this world to gain what only Jesus has to offer. Today, I want to talk to you about our willingness to risk it all, to find it all. Last week, we talked about uh, persecution and we talked about the hope of heaven and those who uh, are willing to set their eyes on Jesus, that there is a reward to come. But what it calls for every follower of Jesus, regardless of what level of persecution we might face, is our willingness to risk everything to follow him. I was reminded of uh, one of the first uh, trips I ever took a group of teenagers on years ago as a youth pastor. We went and we did whitewater rafting and horseback riding and all that kind of fun stuff. But as a part of that, uh, we did this ropes course thing and, and part of it was rappelling. Anybody ever been rappelling? Well, if you haven't been rappelling, here's what happens. Is they strap this uh, belt on you that's uh, incredibly uncomfortable. And then you have to uh, climb up this really skinny, questionable looking ladder up to the top of a platform. And then you get to the top of that platform and they expect you to just turn around and fall off the platform. Now, it's, it's not quite that simple. You've got a rope attached to you and then they tell you it's safe and you're, everything's going to be good. But I remember I took this group of teenagers and I realized, you know what, if they're going to do this, I have to do this and I need to go first to kind of set the example. So I, I climb up this ladder, I get to the top of the platform and I get to the top and I realize the only thing between me and hitting the ground when I jump off of this platform was this, what appeared to be a, a prepubescent uh, teenager that maybe weighed about 100 pounds. <laughs> and I'm looking at me and I'm looking at that person and I kind of realized in that moment, like if I gave him an umbrella and there was a good wind, he'd take off like Mary Poppins. <laughs> and I'm wondering how in the world is this person gonna keep me from hitting the ground? And there's somebody up at the top and they're like, everything is fine, there's this pulley system, you just gotta trust us. And they instruct me to back up to the edge of the platform with my toes on the edge and they want me to fall back. And I'm thinking, you know, everybody's watching. If I don't do this, nobody's going to do this. And all that's between me and the ground is that little kid. <laughs> there is no way he can hold my weight. But until I was willing to trust and fall and let go of control, I was never going to be able to experience the cool uh, experience it was to jump off of that platform. And here's what I realized about our Christian walk as we try to follow Jesus, as a lot of us are thinking, you know what? I'm not sure Jesus can carry the weight of all the stuff I got on me. I'm not sure he's big enough to carry my brokenness, my past, my shame, my troubles, and the obstacles I'm facing. I'm not sure if I can jump off the platform. I'm not sure he can hold me. But what I also know about our Christian walk with Christ is until we're willing to fall, until we're willing to let go of the control that we so desperately hold on to, we will never experience the fullness of life that Christ has for us. And what I want to encourage us is to be willing to risk it all, all that we think this world has to offer, all of the things that we think we can control and handle, risk it all to be able to find it all in Christ. Now, a lot of times when we talk about faith like this, we kind of feel like that Jesus is asking us to be foolish. Now, I'm not asking you to be foolish at least not really foolish. You might look foolish in the eyes of some people in the world, but I'm not asking you to really be foolish. I'm just asking you to be faithful. And here's the difference between faithful and foolish. 
You know that you're being faithful and taking a risk when you are daily connected to Jesus in his word, in prayer, listening for his voice, being silent before him so that when God speaks, you recognize it and you can step out and take a risk knowing that it's God that called you. Now, without that connection, a lot of times taking a risk is just taking a risk. But when we are daily surrendered to Christ and let him move in us, an act of risk can become an act of faith. And when we step out in faith, God says, I am going to do more in your life than what you could ever possibly imagine. Now, this is the life that Jesus calls us to, this life of risking it all to be able to follow him. And Jesus didn't beat around the bush about this. He was actually very clear about the risk that he's calling us to take. Today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to start in verse 24, if you'll read with me. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels. And then he will reward each person according to what they have done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Jesus is very clear about calling us to a risk. Well, let me share a life lesson with you. It's kind of the foundation of this message. Is that we don't experience anything great without a risk. I mean, think about it in your life. If you've got a great marriage, a great career, great finances, great friendships, a great relationship with God, it's on the other side of a risk that you were willing to take. And this is what God is calling us to. That is an exchange here that you risk it all, all that this world has to offer, and in return, you will receive life. Now, what is it exactly that Jesus is saying here? Well, let me kind of set the groundwork for, for this interaction that Jesus has with his disciples. Just before this, Jesus takes his disciples on a little field trip. He knows that they're about to head toward Jerusalem where he's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be crucified. He will die. He'll be buried. And he knows that on the third day he'll rise from the dead. He also knows how incredibly difficult this is going to be for the disciples. He knows that they're all going to scatter and flee and run. They're going to doubt him and doubt themselves. And so he takes them on a little field trip. And before they go south to Jerusalem from the Sea of Galilee, they go north to a place called Caesarea Philippi. And as he gets there and he goes into this town, he asks the disciples a really important question. He says, who do you say I am? And Peter, who often was the one to jump out in the lead, he jumps out and he says, Jesus, I know, I know, I know. You're the Messiah, the anointed one, the Christ. You're the son of God. You're the one that we've been waiting for. And Jesus says, correct, you get an A, that's exactly right. Well done on that statement of faith, Peter. I'm gonna build my church, not just today, but forevermore. And not even the gates of hell will overcome my church. And then they begin to go south and they go to Jerusalem. And it says from that time on, Jesus began to make it clear to his disciples what exactly was about to happen, that he was gonna be arrested and beaten and mocked and crucified. And again, Peter, who thinks that he's got all the answers because he just got the last one right, he steps up and he says, no, 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 Jesus, this is not the plan. Remember, I just told you you're the Messiah. And that means that you're, we're going to put you on a throne and you're going to be king and you're going to make Israel who we were always supposed to be. And Jesus says to Peter, and you know who I am, but you don't know what I'm about. And you don't know why I've come and what I'm going to do to offer my life for yours, to offer my life for the world. That there is a way of redemption that you don't know about. As a matter of fact, Jesus turns to Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan. 
knowing that it was the work of the evil one in Peter to try to distract and, and move Jesus away from his mission. And then he makes this statement that we read in Matthew 16, 24, where he says, if you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross. You got to deny yourself. You've got to be willing to lose your life if you want to be able to find your life. Now that's kind of weird, right? Jesus, like, I'm not really sure what you're talking about. Like, if I lose my life, I lose it. What do you mean? If I lose my life, I find it. Well, the word that Jesus uses for life is really important. Because in the New Testament, there are three different words that appear for the word life. One of those words is the word zoe. And it means to be alive and not dead. I mean, it's the literal idea of life, being alive. This is the word that is used in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish. You won't die forever, but you'll have what? Eternal life, zoe, meaning you're gonna have a physical life for eternity. Right, when we talk about heaven in a couple of months, it's gonna be really important for us to understand. There's gonna be a physical resurrection and you have a physical life and we will be with Christ forever and we will be living and breathing. And this is the promise that God gives. Zoe. There's another word that appears in the New Testament for the word life, and it's the word bios. And this is your physical existence, your daily living, or your existence. It's how we would say, how do you make a living? It's the word bios. It appears in Mark 12, 44. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all that she had to live on, her bios, her daily living. Neither of these two words are the words that Jesus uses in Matthew 16. There's a third word that Jesus uses as he tells us to risk our life to find our life, and it's the word psyche. And it means life and soul. It is the center, and this is important, of awareness and purpose. Jesus talks about this in Matthew 10, 28. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, the psyche. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul, your psyche, your life, and body in hell. This is the word that Jesus uses in Matthew 16, 24. Be willing to deny yourself, take up your cross, risk your life, your purpose, your meaning, your awareness of who you are and why you are, your self-identity, how you understand who you're supposed to be, risk all of that to find your purpose and meaning and life and self-awareness and identity and worth and value in me. Let's look again at these words of Jesus. Verse 24, then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Can I just pause for a second. Every time I read this, it blows me away that Jesus has not yet gone to the cross and risen from the dead. I mean, this must have hit like a bag of bricks, <laughs> right? Like, hey, you think I'm supposed to go on the throne, but what I want you to do is I want you to go be executed. <laughs> That's what it means to follow me. Now, this is all going to make sense on the other side of the resurrection, but they're not there yet. This is a real act of faith, a real risk that Jesus is calling them to. Take up their cross, follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, their psyche, your meaning, your purpose, your self-awareness of who you are and why you are, your worth, your value. Be willing to risk that and lose it. So why? So that you will find your life in me. That's what Jesus calls us to. To be able to risk it all, to find it all in him. Now, what does this risk look like? Well, really, the, the call is for us to follow Jesus. What does it look like for me to follow Jesus? Well, a couple of things. I think the first thing is, it means is for me to seek him. 
Following Jesus is seeking Jesus. That every day when I get up, the first thought on my mind is Christ. When I go to bed, the last thought on my mind is Christ. That I'm praying and listening and in his word and seeking him. Now the reality for a lot of us, if we were honest, what we're really seeking is a paycheck or, or acknowledgement or a reputation or pleasure or comfort or you fill in the blank. And there cannot be two people on the throne of our lives. There can only be one. Am I willing to put him first, seek him in everything? And as I seek him, the second part of this is trusting him. That I'm willing to trust him with my life. That just how I had to trust that, that young preteen to hold me as I was jumping off that platform. We got to be able to trust Jesus that he has the strength to bear the weight of our lives. That I can do it your way because you are faithful and true. And what does it look like to trust him? Ultimately, it's the third part of this, it means obeying him. I cannot trust him if I'm not willing to obey him. And so I've got to get into the word and, and pray over it and listen to it and then do what it says. I've got to listen to the Holy Spirit daily. And when I believe God is speaking to me and what I hear from God lines up with his word, I've got to be willing to risk an act of obedience, even if I don't know where that's leading to. Seeking and trusting and obeying. You see, the life of a Jesus follower should never be defined by trying to get what we want. It should never be defined by protecting me at all costs, even as our, we pray, Lord, protect me from bad things and hard things. That's not what Jesus promised. He said, there's going to be hard things, but I'll be with you in the midst of it and you will overcome because I overcome. It's not about getting what I want. It's not about avoiding hard things. You know what? For a lot of us, it's not even about saving other people. There is a savior and you're not it and I'm not it. So what does it come down to? The one thing that should define a follower of Jesus is just be faithful. Whatever the call, whatever the instructions, whatever the invitation, I will be faithful. I'll seek you. I'll trust you. I'll obey you, especially when I don't understand it. Because you're my everything, Lord. I'll risk it all to find you. And so it really comes down to a choice. I will choose between what the world has to offer and what God has to offer. I will risk being in control and getting what I want or following Christ into the unknown, but knowing that there's real life on the other side. And that's a major choice for us to make. It's a big risk for us to take. To be able to say, Lord, I know that the world wants to tell me who I am and, and I want to be able to decide who I am. And, and there's things that I want and think that I need but Lord, I know that that doesn't really lead anywhere. If I'm willing to risk that all, then you have everything for me, life and purpose and meaning, love and joy and forgiveness and mercy. And there's a reward to come. All right, so it begs the question, what are we risking? All right, and as I prayed over this and thought about it, really every risk that you'll ever take to follow Jesus can really be boiled down into two things. The first thing that you and I will risk is that we will risk getting what we think we want now, right? Uh, there are things that I think are important or that are good or that are, I deserve or, or whatever it is. And Lord, I've got to be willing to risk what I think I want now to be able to find the reward in you. The other thing that we will risk, and, and sometimes this is equally as powerful, is I will risk not doing are not experiencing what everybody else is doing or experiencing. All right, the rest of the world is, is living it up and they're, they're telling you how to live your life and they're telling you what's true and what's good and, and, and what we should be about. And as a follower of Jesus, I can't have many voices. I've got to have one voice and I've got to be able to be willing to risk what everybody else is doing and to be able to follow the way of Jesus. Two things that we risk. 
But what do we gain? Well, ultimately we gain, like we talked about last week, the reward of heaven, eternal life with Jesus. But what I want to tell you today, since we talked about that at length last week, what I want to tell you today is that there are rewards for today as well. That heaven can come to earth in your life right now. And I want to lift up three things that if you're willing to risk the, the, what you think you want now, if you're willing to risk what everybody else is doing to find Christ, here are three things that you will gain as reward. Here's the first. I can have real confidence over pride or insecurity. Now, let me pause for just a second. I'm going to tell you that the three things we're about to talk about are three things that Christ spoke to me clearly as you were so gracious to let me spend some time away on sabbatical. And as I went away, probably the predominant lesson that, that God spoke to me, and it was a hard lesson, is I had an unchecked problem of pride. And I don't mean in the sense that like puffed up and arrogant and thinking that I'm all that. But in the sense that I was struggling, as really so many of us do, thinking that I was supposed to and could be everything to everybody all the time. And when you live that way, it is a constant state of pride and arrogance or insecurity. And we are not meant to find life on what we think we can do. We are meant to find life in what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. And we're, we are willing to trade the control to follow Jesus in return. We can have real confidence in him, meaning I know who I am in Jesus. I don't have to live for affirmation and, and what somebody else tells me about who I am or what I did well or be fearful of what I did wrong. That I know I'm a child of God and I have worth and value and him and my relationships do not have to be defined by what I get from somebody. It can be about what I give to somebody because I have everything I need in Jesus. Are we willing to make that trade? For many of us, that's a hard trade to make. But it's not just the confidence, but I can have real peace instead of hurry. How many of us want to have real peace in our lives? You know, I think about, if you look at the life of Jesus, is there ever a human being that ever accomplished more than what Jesus did? And I'm not just talking about for people who are Christians who know who Jesus is. I'm just talking about just, just be a normal human being and look at the impact of Jesus on the world as we know it. He flipped the world, the cultural understandings of what's right and wrong upside down. He, before it was popular or anybody knew he, we, we were supposed to do it, fought for the rights of women and children. He told us to forgive our enemies. He brought in the value of humility before humility was a thing to value. He brought up a way of living and being that ended up the creation of hospitals and schools and all kinds of organizations that care for those who cannot care for themselves. This is the impact that Jesus made. And as I look at that life, who impacted more than anybody else, you know what? Jesus was never, ever in a hurry. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he had three years of ministry and he was never in a hurry. Now, he was on target. He knew where he was going. He was determined. But he was never in a hurry because he knew this is what belongs to me and this is what doesn't belong to me. And it really goes back to that confidence because so many of us are trying to find who we are and trying to find that confidence. We're trying to do it all. And Jesus is saying, you know, it doesn't all belong to you. I don't want you to be successful. I don't want you to be popular. I don't want you to have all these things that you think are so important. I just want you to be faithful. And if you'll be faithful, I got a lot of good stuff to bring into your life. And you can have peace. Now, when it's not about your effort or your understanding or your knowledge or anything else, it is just about your willingness to risk saying yes to me and know I'm in control. And in knowing that God's in control, I can have real peace. And then number three, I can have real contentment instead of envy. Knowing that my God is both good and my God is for me. He loves me. 
that he is watching over me, that he gives me every good thing, that he gives me what I need. He bestows love and blessing on me. And so I don't have to constantly be looking around at what somebody else has or what somebody else is doing. And I'm telling you, I'm not exempt from this. You know, so much of the time, what a pastor won't ever tell you is that pastors are looking at all the other pastors and seeing what they're doing and what they have and their ministries. And there's a lot of jealousy that goes around. And again, Jesus says, I didn't come to give you all of that. I came to give you what was created just for you. And I promise you it's good. And so we can trade and we can fight against the envy and greed and jealousy and just say, Lord, I want to be content in what you have for me because I know it's good. Do you know you can pray for contentment? If you're struggling to be content and you're pulled by all the other things, just say, Lord, would you give me a spirit, a heart of contentment in you? And he's faithful and good to answer that prayer. So here's what we've got to wrestle with. Question for you. Are there places in your life, maybe it's financial, maybe it's your job, maybe it's your marriage or friendship or some other relationship, maybe it's a a call to serve where you have held on to control rather than risking saying a yes to Jesus. And what I'm asking you to consider is that if you will risk it all, not just some, risk it all, you will find it all in him. Now, how are you going to know where Jesus is speaking? How do you know the difference between faithfulness and foolishness? Well, you've got to connect with him. And if it's not a part of your daily routine and habit and, and heart's longing to pray, to get into his word, to cry out to him, to worship to him, maybe the hardest of all is spend some time in silence before him. I urge you to consider that, that you might know the difference between faithfulness and foolishness. And then ultimately, there might be a takeaway for you right before you even leave this room today, before you turn off your computer or your phone, if you're watching online. And the takeaway might be, you know what? Jesus has been calling you for quite some time to take a risk in one of those areas of life. How cool would it be if today was the day you said yes? And you trust him to be able to step off that ledge, knowing that he has the strength to bear your weight and all the stuff of your life and say yes to him and find out what's on the other side. Because we never experience anything great without a risk. So if you'll stand, I'm gonna pray for us as we do each and every week. These altar areas are open. If you'd like to come pray, talk to God, listen to God. If you want one of our pastors or staff to pray with you, Just wave us on over. We'd love to do that. Or you can bring somebody with you. If you're at home, you can pray right there where you are and say, Lord, is there something in my life I'm holding back from you? Lord, if you were to speak to me, would I even know your voice? Lord, is there a specific thing you're calling me to risk today? I want to say yes to you. That I can find life, that purpose and meaning and and self-awareness and understanding who I really am in you. God, give us the faith to take that risk today. Let's pray. Father, we are just so very grateful for who you are, what you do, what you've done, what you will do, for the promise of heaven, for the promise of eternal life. God, for the promise of rebirth and new life that begins right now today, that we don't have to be controlled by a shifting and changing world a shifting and changing culture that says one day that this is right and another day that this is right, that tries to tell us who we are and how we should live our lives. God, we can silence all those voices for the one voice as you call out to us. So we pray, Father, for clarity. We can recognize your voice. We pray, Father, for faith that we can trust you. We pray, Lord, for courage to step out and take the risk that you call us to take. God, I don't know what specific risk you might be calling people here today to take, but you do. And I pray that you'll speak it clearly. Help them to trust you, to find contentment in you, to find confidence in you. 
and the courage to take that, just that first step. So come Holy Spirit, move in us, do what only you can do. And pray this in Jesus' name, amen.